Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you are listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds well we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one ryan o'donnell ryan or ryan o hails from northern nevada in the grungy yet surprisingly classy and newly renovated reno nevada ryan says he likes his climate like he likes his data evolving uncompromising and progressive he has a master's of science degree that is an ms in applied behavior analysis however his interests have grown to include many others including entrepreneurship and capturing perspectives and stories through various mediums these interests and skills have allowed him to work with a lot of great people Ryan started three businesses, numerous active joint venture agreements, a behavioral think tank, a podcast, a professional development movement, helped organizations that support people with intellectual disabilities. I'm running out of breath just to list a few. Currently, he leads product development and distribution for High Sierra Industries as a learning systems development specialist. Ryan focuses outside this role on building a community of thought leaders and doers to create content that increases the transparency of behavior analytic technologies with the hopes of creating a platform that truly saves the world. Other interests are all over, from artificial intelligence and machine learning applications to the theory and philosophy behind why we do what we do. You can find out more about this at www www.wwdpodcast.com. In Ryan's spare time, you can find him consuming social media, prepping slash climbing a giant mountain, or walking around with a camera in his hand, and occasionally all of those things simultaneously. You can connect, you can connect with him personally on social platforms via at the Daily BA, and let him know what drives you to pursue the behaviour analyst vision. So, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Ryan O to the show today, who is patiently waiting by. Ryan, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for the invite. I'm super excited. Last time we chatted was amazing. So I'm like really pumped to pick up the conversation again. Yeah, we figured out we have a lot of things in common. Firstly, we've got our name. We both like to wear hats. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're both going bored. <laughs> <laughs> and that may or may not be the reason we wear hats. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we like live on the internet, I guess, in a way. And we're content. <laughs> What's your middle name? This would be so weird. Yeah, Lee, L-E-E. Uh, mine's James. Okay, yeah. I'm kind of comfortable with that, though. <laughs> <laughs> and let's dive straight into the first question today, Ryan. Can you please take us back and unpack that bio a little bit more? Tell us about your background, uh, what you're doing now, and then what you mean when you want you say you want to save the world through applied behavior analysis. Yeah, so I grew up in a super small town um, of about... 2,500 people, really traditional values. Um, Like we had dinner around the dinner table until I was like 17 or something like that as a family, just things that most people don't, at least nowadays from my perspective, experience all the time. Really great. I moved into uh, yet an option, either go to Las Vegas or Reno, Nevada, when you're trying to move out of this town that I grew up in. And my mom was like, you're not going to Vegas, Sin City, not a great idea. You go to Reno. So I showed up in Reno for my undergraduate no clue what to expect. Um, much larger, kind of threw me off. And I wasn't sure where I wanted to explore, what I wanted to learn. Um, 
And the first class that I took that was really, uh, I guess, impactful on me and I was doing all right in was this psychology 101 course. So I came back, told my parents like, hey, that, uh, you know, pursuing like the pre-med route, which is my initial thought. I was like, yeah, that's, that's scrapped now. I'm going to change this uh, psychology and try to pursue that. And my dad <laughs> kind of was like, I don't know about this. Like, that's very different. <laughs> it's not a, he was very traditional, like hardworking hands, um, always dirty sort of mentality. Building things is like uh, essentially an engineer. But so this was just out there, but they're very supportive. So I was like, what do I do next? So I signed up for the next class in the sequence, um, which was a principles of behavior class. And it was the first class that I found that I was doing well in. And I no longer wanted to like skip out on school for, because uh, I used to like skip and go to the mountain, go skiing and such. Uh, snowboarding. I was like, no, I'll actually stay and study. And all my friends were like, well, this is weird. What are you studying for? Like, you don't have to study right now. So I was like, I should probably pursue this more. So that field was behavior analysis. Um, that's kind of where the roots started. Uh, I found two or three different mentors that were just really supportive in showing me like how you'd get into grad school. How do you understand the literature? How do you take the literature and apply it into practice? What are the different areas of behavior analysis, um, different applications like we'll get into today? And it was really this complete mind shift, complete shift in how I saw the world when I realized that my behavior, the things that we do um, as humans, as animals, can be influenced by a lot more than I originally thought. And so I, I did a lot of job hopping for about five, six years in helping people in more of the traditional ways in which uh, behavior analysis helps people, which is usually intellectual disabilities. And um, sometimes, in, or, sorry, uh, which is specifically in autism and related disabilities. So a lot of intellectual disabilities from all, all age ranges. So that was, I, I mean, I worked from frontline helping adults with intellectual disabilities that, you know, couldn't speak and were just trying to maintain their skill sets and learn something to make their life a little bit more easy, all the way down to uh, working with children with autism in a school setting, helping them learn their first words and uh, helping putting those smiles and tears in people's faces as they're learning to speak. Um, but I realized that these one-to-one -one models of helping people out were effective in the way that they were set up, but they weren't going to really lead to everybody in the world being able to experience the, the outcomes that some of these procedures can um, produce. So that got me interested in management. So I started going into management roles, trying to figure out how to train staff, this like train the trainer sort of models. And that got me interested in entrepreneurship and kind of business and how do you structure these sort of things. Um, so that's where the, the business has kind of started. We opened a center for uh, children with really severe needs um, behaviorally. So we had two staff for each student that was enrolled in that school um, because of the severity of the behavior problems. And this was in Orlando, Florida called Lodestone Academy. It was great, learned a lot, figured out how to kind of set up a business, the work that goes into it. And uh, the plan was to branch that into an area that I liked a little bit more specifically, like where I wanted to live in the nation. Um, but the timeline changed a little bit. So that bred up the second company. Second company was trying to work on helping people with, you know, uh, sorry, trying to help people uh, labeled as gifted and talented with self-management skill sets, goal setting. Um, how do you get, you know, where it is that you want to get to socially or educationally, et cetera. Um, but I learned a lot of lessons there in that we didn't have the right recipe for the business to really be successful. So now I find myself as like, I've got all these interests, um, you know, I've got all these books from graduate school, all this experience of what I do and a lot of what I don't like. And I've been trying to figure out how to put that all together. And so what that's formed into right now is understanding different various mediums of how to uh, speak, how to present, how to record video, put video, audio content out there, written content to get people interested in this science that's known about, not always in the best light, um, and not always known for some of the applications that are uh, impacting sometimes millions of people that are just kind of lost out there. So it's kind of this gap year right now where I'm trying to figure out how do you tell those really good stories specifically in a video medium right now and networking as much as I can so we can create more training opportunities, but I want to pivot into uh, technology and how do we leverage technology to get back at that root issue that I was talking about of that one-on-one -on -one model works, but it's not scalable. So I think that's kind of a description of what I more into the bio, more into uh, 
what I'm doing now, which is creating a lot of video content and providing conferences um, and training opportunities to others and, and, and networking a lot uh, and where I'd like to go as well. Hashtag leap over to Laura and her amazingness, previous podcast episode guest, Ryan. But Laura puts a shout out to always making sure we uh, pay tribute to our mentors. So let's pay tribute to these mentors. Who, who were they? Two or three mentors you said at university. Yes, awesome. So Eric Dubuque at the University of Nevada, Reno. Also there was um, Melissa Nosick, Mark Malady. They were all great um, for that first chapter, for the graduate school chapter. I'd really lean on uh, Josh Pritchard. He was like my advisor. Um, but we had a, a lab mate. We had a core uh, set of like lab mates, and they were all really influential as well. Uh, four or five of them. That's where the fish lab came in. We got to talk about the fish training, right? Um, and now it's kind of this mix, man. I have uh, someone in marketing, Brittany, that I bounce some ideas off of. Uh, Norm, which I think I might bring up later for an example that's in entrepreneurship that's really successful. So, uh, video. Uh, my buddy Jarek. Like I could kind of keep going. Um, but I've always got someone to bounce ideas off of now to make sure that that I'm, that I'm equipped and I know where my skill sets are, I guess. Awesome. And you said that as you were learning this technology, you saw it was effective, but it was not leading to uh, being, well, the outcomes that you were getting were not being experienced by the masses or the masses weren't benefiting from these. So from the businesses that you said you've started, I got this impression that you you really want to help people with this technology. Yeah. So at its root, like this behavior analysis is just a, a way to help understand what influences people uh, conceptually. Um, but then setting measurable objective, very clear, like how are we going to help you forward and measure and make sure that we actually do those sort of things. Um, so it's packaged in such a way where you can literally know, like, are we helping this person or not? Um, the kind of cool part of it, but also this double-edged sword is that we define behavior as anything that a person does. As such, uh, I could look at anything that is really of social significance. We could talk about how do you effectively podcast? How do you effectively train um, an animal? How do we effectively create a conference? Um, how do we make good video? Like all of these things are now subject to behavior analysis, like that lens and looking at these things. But there's, we know there's a lot more that goes into it um, than just one field trying to help solve a problem. So. I guess to kind of bring this back around, very interested in what we are good at as uh, behavior analysts, but I'm really interested in what other fields are doing very effectively so we can start to merge those together. Does that help? Yeah, let, let's unpack it a little bit more and let's um, build into that, that you, you mentioned earlier that you want to impact people that are kind of lost out there. Well, so take take where you were at with what you were saying and going back to that little bit you put there. What, what did you mean by that? And maybe just, just build on a little bit more. Yeah. So in in graduate school, this, this mentorship model was really heavily put into the lab that I was in. So you had someone that was with their PhD that was really kind of guiding you where to go, but you had these lab mates that were thrown in the 40, 50, 60 hours a week outside of classes, like barely sleeping to try to understand as much as they possibly could. But there's so much out there that it kind of was like really interesting to dive in into all the different areas of what behavior analysis can offer, but I wasn't really sure what to do next because um, I kind of had my head down in one field way too much. So one of those things that I came across with my lab mates during our, our exploration and all these different things were um, this thing that was developed by a researcher named Al Poling, but also a company called Apopo. And what they were doing is they're trying to solve the problem of how do we actively help uh, rid countries that were just scattered with landmines um, after civil wars? And how do we effectively do that? Because the typical time that this sort of takes for traditional kind of, you'll sometimes you'll, people recognize them, they're like suited up and just complete gear to where if they were to accidentally step on a landmine when trying to find them, that they'd hopefully survive these sort of things. And people go out there with like these metal detectors and they have to scan, take something like a tennis court. A tennis court can take four days for a person to go through. And when you're talking about a country <laughs> that is, uh, we don't know where these things are. 
you're talking about this is just not going to work. It's not, it's not practical to go out there and do those sort of things, especially after a war and toward country um, with all the economic issues and situations that will be going on after that as well. So when I talk about saving the world, it's not in this like a behavior analysis can be the end all be all to help do that. But it's, it's more of this, how do we interdisciplinary bring people together that want to solve a problem that will really impact and make the world better? And this isn't because we need to make money. This isn't because of those sort of things. It's, there's some sort of pain point that is being experienced by people that um, we would like to solve. So this one was uh, an example from Mozambique where they uh, literally had landmines being placed within elementary schools. So after the Civil War, they had to go in and figure out how to how to solve this sort of problem. And when you're talking about the different influences that people have, a, a Western culture, sort of American perspective, where the researchers were coming from to try to go into there and say, here's some ways that we know we can help find these landmines. It doesn't necessarily work. You got to fit within the culture, within that economic context, right, of what's going on. So what they worked on developing was uh, essentially a solution where they would train African pouched rats uh, since they're really good at their sense of smell. They're everywhere there. Um, and, and a funny note, they're kind of perceived as, as these, you know, rodents, these things you don't want to have around, but they're everywhere. So they were a very uh, kind of quick resource for people to be able to access. Um, and they taught them how to sniff out the uh, specific chemicals that are used in activating those landmines. So now you have an animal that won't trigger it because they're not heavy enough to actually trigger. Um, they're kind of these cute little things. They're on a leash. They're being walked around and they can smell them, identify them. And when they do, now people know where to go in and actually deactivate these sort of things. So they took that problem of four days to be able to clear a tennis court and they can do it in 20 minutes now with one of these rats. So that would, would be an example of like, quote, saving the world trying to help somebody out. Um, an entire country was eradicated of this fear of landmines as a result of uh, a training program with a bunch of African pouched rats that went out, smelt out these landmines. People came in, deactivated them. Um, and this whole like crowdsourcing campaign of like, you and I could hop on and uh, donate, you know, whatever it is, 12 or 15 bucks to have a rat kind of out there uh, getting this sort of training going out there. So it was very economical, I guess is what I'm getting at and like built into their culture. And created some, some pretty cool, so far it looks like, like more long-lasting economic situations where they could start rebuilding again too. Nope. Perfectly chosen yeah. an example. Uh, and for anyone listening that wants to learn more about that amazing project, uh, head back to earlier podcast episode of Haley Ellis from Apopo. Uh, so cool what they're doing there. Yeah. It's insane. It's insane, man. So... I realized the other day, as in yesterday, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Wendy, when I was talking to you on Facebook and I was like, do your ABC. And you're like, what the heck is an ABC? Mm -hmm. That we, we suffer from a curse of knowledge sometimes. Sometimes we're standing here talking to someone at our level. Uh, we need to dumb it down. So most people that listen to this podcast, I would assume, and I might be wrong, know what ABA is. Uh, but cool. let's just rewind a little bit. Uh, and just give a quick definition of what we're talking about here. What is applied behavior analysis? Cool. Um, so the field itself is called behavior analysis. And then on that rests a couple of things. So if you want the, the perfect framework, you have your kind of theory philosophy and rested upon that is three different pillars. Your first one would be the experimental analysis of behavior. That is just uh, looking at things in really controlled settings. Imagine your your lab coat, ivory tower, people looking at those sort of things. Not that to paint that picture, but like you're looking at very controlled situations where you're trying to research and understand the principles, the things that guide uh, behavior. Now, the ABA branch came out more so in like uh, the mid 60s is where the 50s, 60s where it started to develop. And that specifically was looking at how do we take what we're learning in the research lab and apply it to socially significant issues. So really anything that's built off of behavior analysis that's trying to help a socially significant issue, um, which is, I would say, anything that is, you know, ethical, moral, that people are struggling with and trying to help them out with, that could be anything from therapy to autism um, uh, therapy, like we talked about, it could be helping the organizational workplace, coaching, et cetera. When you're using that sort of knowledge and those really uh, understanding what it is that people do, why they do it, and then helping them measure progress towards their goal. That is your ABA 
Your last one then over there is, uh, and it's, it's, it's still got that research component. I kind of left that out there. You're still making sure that you're, you're measuring as much as you can to understand exactly what's going on. Now, the last one is behavioral technology. And this technology is uh, exemplified perfectly in that uh, Apopo example. What they've done is they've taken uh, the, the, the rats, the people, figure out how to train and specifically solve that sort of problem. So ABA is kind of talked about two ways. Um, it's sometimes talked about as that behavioral technology, sometimes talked about in that more controlled manner. Um, how's that? Too much? Perfect. Okay. Loved it. And let's, as I always say, I've got to stop saying this and just acknowledge that I have too many questions. <laughs> I'm just at the time. But just before we do move on to the next question, um, Another thing you mentioned there that we really wanted to talk about in your journey, in your odyssey, uh, was your time training fish. So can you yeah. just quickly tell us about that and then bring us up to speed. Explain to everyone listening what the daily BA is. Okay. So part of grad school uh, was trying to figure out where I could learn as much as I possibly could. That mentor that I talked about, Josh Pritchard, he had set up the uh, fish lab at the Ford Institute of Technology. And this was a place for students to come in and try to understand just basic principles that, that govern behavior. So um, everything, we didn't get into punishment and, and areas like that. It was just simply reinforcement-based procedures to we're trying to essentially reward with food um, different behaviors. Now, that was kind of in three ways. Your first thing you would do is you'd have this like wand that you would use to be able to put into the water to, so you could, you know, hit a plunger at the top and give a little bit of food when they did whatever it is that you were trying to shape up. So the first thing to learn was just how do you get that wand in the water with a fish that's not scared of it? Because when you, you know, if you imagine being a fish in water and it just like flies down and this plunger pops open, like it's, it's scary. It scared, it scared the fish away and you get those sort of responses. So you had to learn how to, uh, help the, the fish adapt to um, and teach them to kind of follow those wands and such. Once you got that down, you could move it into uh, an automated system. So we had a infrared sensor uh, hoop. They would swim through that. That infrared sensor would recognize that they swam through and you could automate this now. So I could drop a food pellet um, on the other side of the tank as soon as they swam through it. This is really cool because now I can step back. I um, as the kind of researcher, the person could start to change the different parameters of what was going on there. So we'd ask questions like, if I reinforced every time they went through the hoop, what would happen? If I reinforced every fifth time they went through the hoop, what would happen? If I reinforced variably every like 10 to 15, what would happen? And we knew these things from, you know, research and literature that we read in class, but seeing them and like experiencing them, being a part of it was a totally different situation. So there were some lessons learned there, which is uh, it's very weird to work in water as a first thing. Um, if I were to try to, you know, say something like when I'm working in a training or, you know, we're on this podcast or something, I, you know, you and I can nod at each other. We can say good job. We can kind of praise and those sort of things to kind of keep our behavior going in a certain direction. Um, a, I couldn't do that with fish. B, if I did it in water with these pellets, um, all of a sudden you could learn like, for example, let's have them go through the hoop and I'm going to reinforce that. When they go through the hoop, if I deliver just a split second too late and they've turned away, what I actually might reinforce is them swimming away from the hoop, not swimming through the hoop. So I learned that the timing is just completely crucial. Um, and like almost down to the millisecond or the, you know, the split second as is, is just crucial on these sort of things. And uh, that was, those are the sort of things that we would explore around with. So um, the one thing that I would say is kind of my like quote claim to fame that I like to tell out of that experience was uh, this idea of goldfish having three second memories. It's been kind of debunked in other places. It's talked about a lot, at least in the States is this kind of myth and joke, but we were able to teach them to swim through hoops um, and bring those hoops back. And you could have different colored hoops and signals and such to really control for this. Um, if people want to talk about that, we could do that offline. But um, we were able to go for about four and a half months uh, is how long these fish would remember is what we were finding. Not that that's a hard line in the sand, um, but we were able to push it that far with training programs to, to get these fish to remember. So it was, it was uh, first and foremost, a place to really train and understand. Um, second, a place to kind of explore as well, like uh, questions like that. And that is really nice with that infrared. I know that a lot of ATA members and, and others that I've interacted with that have 
uh, it's called an R2 fish training kit yep. that you can buy now. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And th- then we worked with a company that would set us up with the infrared and um, that was kind of a crazy like ten twenty thousand dollars setup to be able to have all the all the infrastructure there to kind of like go through that. Um, so yeah, to kind of add more, I guess it would it would wrap up with uh, so like my typical day is I would come back um, from graduate school or work or whatever, and we'd have ten to twelve fish that were on different training programs or different schedules that we were kind of experimenting around with. And that was kind of my evening. I'd hang out with the fish every 20 to 30 minutes. I'd be, you know, setting up a new condition, understanding, looking at data. It was just a fun way to explore. Um, if anyone wants to get in the automation, that's, that's where you can learn a lot really quickly. It was really fun to check out. Yeah, I was going to say the timing, timing of that swimming through the hoop is something that people are challenged with with that R2 fish school kit that they don't tell you yeah. on, on the box. And... I was going to ask about infrared. So if you're a trainer and training fish and you got a spare 20 grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, no, no, that was like for the, the bells and whistles and everything like yeah. that. I think you can get that thing for like 400 or 500 bucks US. Like it wasn't too crazy. Um, an interesting thing, if anyone does try to attempt that, fish see infrared, um, at least the, the species that we were working with. So uh, it was this thing where we taught them to go through the R2 and then all of a sudden, you you know, you'd set up the other hoop and you expect hopefully for some generalization to go through that hoop, but it looked like a wall to them. So we had to like totally reteach that essentially, or I would assume it would look like a wall. Um, so there's lessons learned there. They were very, very fun, not only to uh, experience yourself, but then teach and watch others. Um, I'd quite often have undergraduates or graduate students that were in there, um, trying to teach fish how to go through certain things. But what they would do is they'd train up because of those subtleties that they'd miss, uh, these crazy patterns of going in different corners and, you know, running figure eights and like just like really crazy patterns of behavior that would shape up. That sounds like fun. <laughs> bring, us up, <laughs> bring us up to speed now, Ryan. W- w- uh, where can people go to find out more information about you now? And uh, what is the Daily BA? So yeah, the Daily BA uh, is, the Daily Behavior Analyst is what it's short for. I wanted to get into trying to create something daily for the field that was talking about cool applications of behavior analysis like this or ways to explore and understand why we do what we do, like that R2 fish school sort of things and such. And uh, I only really move my behavior through really crazy public commitments. So uh, coming back on a flight uh, after New Year's, I was like, I'm going to actually try to go with this this video production and see where I can get. Because um, I'd kind of just been, mm, in a way, playing around with it for a year and a half. I wasn't really committed to it. And I said, yep, I'm going to go for it. So I saw that the handles were there on social media, the Daily BA. Um, get a little bit surprised by that. And, on, and then I, I, I grabbed the URL, set up the YouTube channel. Um, and just started hitting record and seeing what I could do. So yeah, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, they're all there. The daily BA is how you find it. Uh, the goal was something interesting in behavior analysis daily, Monday through Friday was my commitment. I got off track on that. I'm trying to catch back up. Uh, getting this battle as you try to increase your production quality, uh, it gets harder to put out things that aren't that quality. So I'm battling that right now. Um, but yeah, there's a hundred episodes, I guess now, and uh, it's primarily video content. I'm going to play around with the podcast just for some different things later this, uh, different content later this year. Um, so that's in the work as well. Hey, thanks so much for your offerings so far, Ryan. I love hearing about people's behavioral odysseys. So thank you very much for <laughs> sharing. Moving forward, I'd really like to talk about something super exciting, the convergence of human training, animal training, and technolo- technology, I can't speak, technology <laughs> conference. What is this, Ryan? Can you tell us about it and how it all got started? Yeah, so it's a two-day conference we, we held in Seattle about, I don't know, a month or so ago, July 3rd and 4th, um, I believe. And it came about through, seems like how the rest of stuff in my life kind of goes about, um, just kind of moving forward, trying to push this idea of like, Behavioral science could be used to like help a lot of different people and solutions and problems out. And specifically, we had a conference in Miami where we were bringing together entrepreneurs, behavioral scientists, um, some tech people, and clinical psychologists together, about 150 people, just to talk about how you can try to branch outside of your, your typical roles that you see in behavior analysis. Um, and one of the sponsors was Tag Teach International, and Joan specifically on their team was talking to me and just said, hey, we should uh, put a a conference on together. And I was like, what would that be like? And so we just made a commitment to talk 30 minutes every week. We talked that much for what, four, I think it was four months. We 
through the meantime, just kind of sort out who is in each other's social circles, um, potential ideas, venues, timing of the year. Everything seemed like a really good idea. They wanted to go for it. We wanted to go for it. These sort of events where you're trying to, you know, convince a lot of people to come into one place uh, with all the different competing, you know, things that are going on in the world uh, it can be risky sometimes when, on, the, on the business side. And we both said, yeah, this is, this is good. We should go for it. And we had a fantastic lineup of speakers that all agreed to do it. Um, we had, uh, Gina come on board to help with the volunteer aspects and like without all those things coming together, it would have never really been as successful as it was, but it, um, I, I don't like to toot my own horn, but like we, we did damn well. And it was, I was surprised. <laughs> um, we had a total of four minutes that we were off for the whole conference for two, two days, which is unheard of. So yeah, just fantastic team. The goal is bring together these different people, share stories, ideas, data, and see where that can take us. Um, so those are kind of our pillars. We're gearing up to do it again this next year. And it'll be around the same time, July 13th, 14th, or 20th, 21st, we're figuring it out. Still going to be bigger um, the next year, but not too big. The single track, like everybody experiences the same things is really important to us to maintain. Um, and we've locked in some of the same speakers, Joe Lang being one of them, uh, talking about just crazy applications of artificial intelligence and how that's transforming therapy industries already in our world. Um, all the way to Susan Snyder is going to join us, um, which is, uh, extremely, um, knowledgeable, just <laughs> insanely knowledgeable in, in all these different facets, um, from genes to consequences, uh, affecting our behavior to, um, anything you can kind of imagine there, different applications, different species, et cetera. So that's how it was born. Um, and that's the intentions for next year. Yeah, amazing. And Susan Snyder, awesome. She's yeah. been one of the most popular podcast guests we've had on the show. So cool. sure that's going to be amazing. And you had the likes of Ken Ramirez, Susan Friedman, yes. Theresa McEwen. So you had some big names in our industry there. Yeah, yeah. Huge people that were just awesome and uh, like delightful along every step of the way too, which is hard to find sometimes. Like I'm telling you, this thing was just perfect. <laughs> it was a little scary how perfect it was. <laughs> um, from logistics to speakers to you know, everything. Um, so I'm hey excited. Man, you, you, you can toot your own horn. It's all good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's uh, it's funny. We call it convergence. It was like the right convergence of the team it was what helped pull it off too. Um, just like everything came off well. So we're trying to replicate that for next year because um, there was no big pain points um, from anybody. And I heard that some feedback was that it was the best conference ever. Yeah, which... <laughs> I don't know. I love no pressure <laughs> to repeat that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember that was one of the speakers, Vicky Tucci. Um, it's been to hundreds of conferences. It was very nice to hear. Um, you know, one thing I, you were talking about, shouting out to mentors. Uh, this is not a mentor of mine, but somebody that I've read through and I watch and uh, idolize in many ways, uh, which is Steve Hayes. He's here, a professor at University of Nevada, Reno. Um, but he created this uh, model that they call the ACT Boot Camp model, ACT for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Um, and we modeled off of some of those things, which one key thing was just treat your speakers and your customers with the most respect you possibly can, which seems like an easy thing to do, but it's, and the, you know, when you're trying to put on a big event, it can lose sight. So we just, I think that's where she was coming from is, um, we were there every beck and call, what do you need? Making sure they're ready, et cetera. Um, and we want to continue to do that. That's kind of our niche. I think that we're going to be developing here is, um, not the biggest, the, the, the best in some other ways, but we're going to be there for everybody. Yeah, I mean that's what the conference is about, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. So that and uh, we're we want to see if we can tackle the whole. What do you do the other three hundred and sixty three days of the year <laughs> outside of the conference? Um, so we're we're playing around with some ideas there. If anyone has ideas on how to truly really help fill those needs, uh, we're always open to them. So let us know. And can you give us any more information about next year you, did you say that already sorry dates and times yeah I don't know if you have that information or you can release it or we're, we're committed to july 13th and 14th right now sounds like we might have a really stellar venue that might push us back a week to july 20th 21st so if you're looking to to really lock in wait a little bit um you can keep up at convergenceconferences.com with what's going on there uh, and we're on social media under convergence conferences as well um but any social channel like we can point you in the right direction so just reach out and I was at the zoo last time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, really great setup. Um, we had uh, visitors and the like of uh, Toucan, a um, bunch of different other... I didn't see all the different animals that came in, but we had a lot of different visitors that came in. That was pretty awesome. Um, some flamingos, I think, at one point. Um, 
<laughs> animals I'm not used to being around that some of the speakers are around every day and it was really exciting. Um, but yeah, this year it looks like we'll be at a different venue simply just because the other one can't meet the demand that we had. Um, so we need to kind of grow a little bit and we'll see if we can partner and, and get some people back into that zoo because they were fantastic. Like I'm telling you, like every aspect was good, including the aspect of the venue and them helping us out. And I remember I was, I think I was recording a podcast that morning or doing a web class or something and I finished that and jumped over to, to see what was going on and there was just two people on stage dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a... Uh, um, you know, I, I go to these conferences specifically in behavior analysis and they're very academic. They're very research-based. Um, they're very dry. And I don't think that that is a, a bad thing. Like those things have their places where you need to just get out of the nitty gritty. Um, but then I go to these conferences that are like VidCon and PodCon that are specifically meant for people to experience, um, you know, like your Tony Robbins sort of experiences or whatnot, where you're, you're there for an experience that you're paying for. Um, more so than the information is kind of how they're structured. So we wanted to see if we can start to blend those sort of things together a little bit. So it sounds like you came in on one of the breaks, which every break had some sort of movement involved. Um, cause there's a, a guy in our field, Nick Green, that's very into movement. And he talks about, uh, sitting is the new smoking is his kind of tagline. And we need to get people moving. So every break was a structured break with something like dancing, um, moving, stretching, et cetera. So me and Ryan are going to continue to do the rest of the podcast doing star jumps and talking to you at the same time. So sorry <laughs> if we run out of breath. And that's fantastic. And thank you so much for sharing. It's oh, a yeah, lot of for fun sure. to learn about. And like I said, we'll link to all of this stuff in the podcast right up so you can, if you're interested in that, because I definitely am. It sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, be joining next year again online. Yeah. I can't most likely won't be able to get over to America yeah. for it. But yeah. that, that's the cool thing about it. You just jump online. Yeah, yeah. We left that out. Yeah, online because, I mean, it's trying to make it more accessible. If anyone's in a spot where they're um, a little strapped on trying to figure out how to get over here or, like, get there, and um, we got some volunteer opportunities as well sometimes. So reach out if you're in that situation too. Your inbox is going to be full, I'm sure. <laughs> that's all right. I think Next thing I wanted to talk about was something we hadn't touched on at numerous, numerous points uh, throughout the episode, but this is technology. Now, I am a massive tech geek. People always come to me for tech questions, etc. but I think I possibly could pale in comparison to you. I don't know about <laughs> I <wanted> that. To, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to discuss something now that we've geeked out about before. We have not geeked out, I should say, sorry, about on this show before, and, and that is artificial intelligence. It's an animal training show. Why would we talk about artificial intelligence? All right. But, yeah, tell, tell us where this, your yeah. understanding, your offerings of where this is and how this is going to help with managing our animals' behavior. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about AI first and then get into the animal sort of part of it. Um, for me, a quick demonstrated example is maybe you use Google Maps and you just left a place where you just ate some dinner for the first time. You're out with uh, your significant other, family, et cetera. And it pops that little notification and say, hey, how was it? Do you mind writing a review? That is artificial intelligence like in action actually happening. Uh, maybe you have Siri or you have other voice devices. I have one by Amazon here, which I'm not going to say so it doesn't interrupt us um, during the recording. Um, but those sort of things are artificial intelligence. So what it is is essentially um, automating this process of helping identify um, some pain point that, uh, you know, that humans are experiencing and trying to solve that through an automated process. And just think about them. They're talking about it as an algorithm, but specifically it's just a decision tree in a sense of if this, then this is kind of broken down. And yeah, I got really interested in it uh, because this is how you could start to automate these sort of things. So when it comes to applications that I'm aware of, people are looking at how to, um, uh, I mean, a, a mainstream one is Tesla, right? Tesla's using cameras around all of its cars to be able to understand um, what are objects that we need to avoid, what are ones that are moving that are cars, what are ones that are maybe a bag in the road that are okay to drive over um, that you don't need to necessarily swerve for. Like, these are the sort of things that they, the decisions that they can start to make. And it just takes massive amounts of data um, to be able to, to to do these sort of things. So an opportunity that I see in the field is being able to take the data that a, a specific practitioner, clinician, maybe you're working with a child with autism, maybe it's in uh, talk therapy and you're helping somebody out as like a marriage and family um, sort of counselor. Maybe you're, you're collecting data on 
uh, the participants that you're training as, you know, in your train the trainer model, when you're helping some people out on a Saturday, you know, at the local park, understand how to work with their dogs, any of these sort of situations, there's data in the sense that there's things that are happening that are measurable. That's all I mean by that. If we could take this and share this in a platform and then do two things, analyze it on this bigger kind of larger scale, which is where the AI would come in, but also kick it back out to others in this sort of way. Imagine like a Google where you could be like, what's the best way to do this? But it's not relying just on what's put on Google. It's actually measuring based off of data. Like here's the best solution to your problem. Um, that's where I see the applications, this sort of thing going. So I don't know if there's a certain pain point maybe we can play around with uh, when it comes to animal training to see if we could get to how AI could be the solution. You want to throw something at me? Yeah, I'm thinking like timing, you know. I'm thinking, say, a, a camera recording your training session with your dog mm -hmm. uh, and collecting data about hand movements, uh, behavior in relation to hand movements or clicks or whistles or verbal bridges yep. or whatever you're doing and then be able to like put that into, a, uh, you call it a decision tree or yeah. algorithm uh, and for that to kick back information to you and say, hey, you got your clicks with good timing like, you know, 12% of the time. Like, yeah. here's how you focus on it. Have another go. Mm -hmm. Pull your data out. And here's like here's like your video back for you slowed down so you can really see what you're yeah. doing. Yeah. So, you're doing. Yeah, exactly. So we've seen parts of this in different industries. So obviously, if you're the Tesla, you can go all out and you're kind of crazy with, you know, how far you're developing this. You maybe think of uh, basketball. I used to play a lot of basketball. And uh, there's programs that will record to where your coach could kind of break down, right? So they got the components there to where you could say, this is what you need to be doing. Um, the AI is really valuable when we're talking about how do you practically pull off that example? So you just described um, how do we timestamp essentially every single click, treat, turn, <laughs> word that's said, command, et cetera. So yeah, those, those ways in which we've typically solved that problem, trying to figure out, you know, your timing issues and such. Like you remind me of basketball. I, I watch basketball coaches record um, people's shots and games and go through and they'd have to mark the actual time, tell the student to go back and look at those sort of things, just like you would in this example that you gave. Um, and it's just painstaking. Like it takes so long to go through and do those sort of things. But this is where technology can come in. You can actually um, teach computers to understand how these sort of um, certain movements are repetitively done. Like this is the movement when you see this sort of action happening frequently. Um, you can integrate sensors. So they call it the Internet of Things, IoT. You can bring any sort of thing with a sensor essentially, and it can actually kick data back into this as well. So what you're now faced with though is this problem of you have a lot of data. You have these things time stamped, right? All these different movements that the trainer is doing, the things that the dog's doing, the data coming from the video feed, et cetera. Um, it's just, it's massive amounts of data that you have to now understand how to help people out with. So that's the problems that people are solving now. Like how do we do those sort of things? That's where the proprietary and like the big businesses are really going for as well, because there's a lot of value in those sort of things. Um, um, but specifically I'm interested in it because you can help to automate these sort of things and you can share everything back to people. So like your example, I can now automate, you know, delivery of here's where you're messing up on your timing. Um, consistently. And even if it's like, say, you're messing up 90% of the time, 75% of the time, you might have one certain behavior or that you do that, you know, results in 50% of your timing mistakes. Now, you know, as a practitioner, where do you get the biggest bang for your buck, right? As your trainer, your biggest bang for the buck, so that you know how to move forward with this data as well. So I really think the applications are endless. Um, and to the point, you know, if you start talking about like virtual reality and be able to create training simulations where you don't have to actually simulate it in the real environment, right? <laughs> like we might not have to leave our house in another 10 years. We could just train virtually maybe somewhere and everything's going to be good to go. Um, I don't think it's going to be that fast, but it gets, it gets pretty crazy pretty quick. So then like next level is like, you know, I sell a program or you sell a program or someone else comes out with a program mm -hmm. that says, okay, here's the 20 uh, behaviors that you want to train your dog for X reason. Yeah. Uh, and then the, 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 you put the camera and the dog in front of the camera and it's got like some kind of dispensing mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, it, tra it trains a dog for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, that like that pos the technology is here to do that. The uh, whether or not that specific solution is being created or not, I don't know for sure. Um, but those things across so many different industries are actively being pursued right now. It's insane. Um, 
there is an uh, not even a prototype, like an actively sold um, like hologram um, assistant slash like unclear if it's like a significant other <laughs> over in Asia to where you can essentially buy this. Uh, it's, it's not even that ex expensive. I think it's like 200 bucks or something like that to where you basically have this like assistant that'll, you know, help remind you um, maybe text you during the day and say like, Hey, hope you're having a good day. Those sort of things. Um, it'll ask you, you know, like when are you gonna be back home for dinner? So I make sure I have the lights on like crazy stuff, right? Like it, and it, and it varies these sort of things. Um, and that's, that's a part of people's lives right now to where, uh, maybe you don't have the social skills or that you don't want to, um, be interacting with people, um, or a significant other in the ways that technology could kind of fill this gap. Um, and it's actually happening. So, these are little glimpses and like there's examples out there like that that are happening um, that could very quickly be all over the world. Yeah, there's a movie about that. I can't remember what it's called, but it's freaking good. It's yeah. pretty recent. Yeah. Does that, um, does that ring a bell for you? He like he starts dating a, um AI. Yeah. But like madly falls in love with it. Yeah, no. Um there's there's literally case examples of people madly falling in love with the thing that I just talked about, that technology. Like, that happens. Like, it's a movie, but it also happens. Um, it's 2018, and that's happening. And uh, we know with technology, those things sort of exponentially keep growing. So um, the next 10, 20, 30 years would be pretty insane. I, I think it's reasonable to say there'll be a day where uh, we talk about driving um, and how dangerous it was and how we were even allowed to be in control of the wheel, driving a car, um, when technology can do it so much better. Um, the data Tesla has on reducing serious injuries um, and avoiding collisions and stuff is just insane. It's better than any human can do. Um, we have problems with letting go of that control that we, we perceive that we have. Um, and there's definitely moral issues and things to worry about there, but um, if it's in the betterment of helping people out and gives me more access and time to help other um, problems out or work with other people or just enjoy life like I'm all for it <laughs> personally so there's yeah there's uh, this kind of fear that I have that <laughs> I'm sure is shared by others um, that we're going to be obsolete to some extent yeah so the last couple of conferences um, that I've been a part of that I, I, I don't put them on but I'm uh, in, invested in like kind of going and because there's a community there and behavior analysis, uh, we've made sure we had a panel discussion just on that topic, and we have people from both sides. Um, and my understanding of that is there is a platform called a platform called OpenAI.org or .com, something like that. And it is everybody that is essentially partnering to make sure that we're in the best position possible to where artificial intelligence, machine learning, these sort of things are used for the greater good, and that they can't be used for... Um, things that aren't the greater good. And if you want a real world example, I think the heat that has been felt by Facebook this year is a good example of how these things can be used uh, not in our favor per se. Like we can be influenced by things that we don't necessarily think that we're opting into, um, but we are opting into. Um, so OpenAI is a platform that's really for that. But there's uh, like Elon Musk, for example, he'll, he's, he's part of that OpenAI um, and he champions that, and he will never go on the record for saying Google, but he, he talks about a text giant that he's yet to name <laughs> that is in Silicon Valley, um, that he's afraid of them being able to, uh, you know, really drive human behavior into ways that, um, on a massive scale, that people aren't necessarily opting in for. Um, and Google's been experimenting around with things like that. So unclear if it's them. Everyone basically thinks it is <laughs> but yeah it could be it could be a scary grim future or it could be really awesome um i think the point here is it's it's happening it's it's going to happen regardless so how do you want to actively get involved i kind of look at like politics and that's in that in that you know do you want to opt in yes or no to like making the world better okay if it's if you're going to ai is part of it now so what's your stance um and how are you going to get involved in that rather than uh, kind of sitting on the sidelines, which is okay too. But if you want to, you know, be a part of the game, like it's happening. That is the future. Yeah, and slightly diverging from animal training, which is fun. Hopefully uh, you guys out there enjoy <laughs> this conversation. Uh, but I tend you, uh, I mean, it's already happening in the animal training world as well. You talked about that uh, virtual assistant 
mm-hmm. uh, new, new meaning to the word virtual assistant uh, earlier. But I sent you a link in last week or the week before about uh, uh, something you can buy and you leave it on of your horse in their stables uh, and it records their behavior and it sends you information when your horse is doing something that's abnormal. So, yeah. I mean, it's already out there as well and it's not expensive. No. Uh, and big shout out to Josephine now for sharing that in the ATA Engage Facebook page and yeah. bringing our awareness to it. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> there's examples like everywhere. Uh, one that I use to my advantage is every time I come into my studio, like where I'm recording this right now, uh, it timestamps when I'm in, when I'm out, uh, have it automatically turn on the lights and those sort of things as a result of my proximity. Um, and part of that is, is I like the automation of things, but people kind of give me a hard time sometimes as to like, why would you spend a half hour of your time setting up your lights to automatically come on in and out, you know, for the year? Like, shouldn't you just flip the switch in when you, when you come in? Um, are you saving that time? But you can, uh, you can use these tools to answer those sort of questions. Now at the end of the year, I'll have a timestamp of every time I went out, in and out of the studio, I just do a quick Excel function for about one minute. And I can tell you how much time I saved as a result of this AI, you know, in a very simple form of just turning my lights on when I come in and out. Um, and I think, I think like th- those are, those are ways in which it's impacting my life right now. Um, and those other, you know, more crazy ones that we're talking about are coming but you can, I guess my point is you can look around and find these things all over the place. Your Google Maps telling you that, uh, you know, it's red and you're going to experience uh, some sort of, you know, delay on your ride home. That's because they're tracking how many phones are moving along the freeway. They know how average that, they know the speed of that freeway. They know how many, the, the volume of phones that are moving at that speed and that it's slower than the speed limit by a certain amount, which means that there's likely a car crash. Like, they don't get a report of a car crash from a human. They just know by all this data that, hey, there's been a car crash and you're going to be delayed by this many minutes. And they're accurate. Like, it's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. It, bl- it blows my mind. <laughs> it does. I mean, because, I mean, I don't spend much time learning about it, but when I do, I'm just like, yeah. 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 Um, so I'm looking to learn a lot more into these areas. I know this kind of, you know, more as a consumer and uh, interest in technology and just following a bunch of tech channels, what what can happen, but I'm looking to actually get involved in how this sort of stuff works next year. Awesome. Looking, looking forward to uh, more applications to, to our field. There's already yeah. some out there. Uh, if you scout the internet, there's, there's uh, studies being done. There's science yeah. out there now as well um, in journals. and yeah. So exciting. But we're going to have to move on. <laughs> uh, hopefully that was beneficial for uh, all of your listeners out there. Now what I was hoping to geek out about was to continue this and talk about different conceptualization systems when looking at behavior and full transparency. I have a uh, massive in my script that I have in front of me in big capital letters knowledge <laughs> gap here. So I, I'm going to pick your brain uh, and to get you to dumb stuff down for, for me <laughs> and for our listeners, our friends. So let's start off with describing... What is a conceptualization system for looking at behavior? What do we mean when we say that? Okay. So let's talk about something like motivation. So we can say um, everybody to some degree in some aspects of their life is struggling with motivation in some sort of facet. <laughs> like I think that's just a thing. Uh, if not now in this moment, then tomorrow or next week or in the past. When we talk about motivation, though, there's so much that can go into that. So if you think about, uh, if you search and try to find a motivational app maybe to help you out, um, those apps never work. No one's nailed that on the head. They can't say, here's your motivational app to get you to achieve all your life's dreams, goals, aspirations, et cetera. Um, And so those words get really big. There's a lot of behavior that goes into them. So the idea was, can we take something like motivation and can we break that down into a way that we, we say these terms in a certain way, we always say them in this way so that we're, we're really clear with each other, you know? Um, it's like it's like if you were calling the same species of dog um, uh, or all the different species of dog that were just one species, right? All of a sudden we have this problem where we can't talk about these things because we're all calling different things the same thing. It's very unclear. So what they did with like motivation is they broke that down 
into how do we understand, you know, motivating you to do things more or motivating you to do some things less. Let's call those two different things of something you want to do more or something you want to do less, different terms. So when we're talking about motivation now, I now have two different ways to talk about motivation. And that does increase complexity. But now what it's done is it made it to where I'm a little bit more clear when I talk about motivation in some ways, right? So a conceptualization system is just trying to understand, um, specifically, it's just like a term of how do we understand this behavior to work? Um, and if you wanted like other examples, so when you're talking about neutrons, protons, when you're talking about physics, right? Like those are concepts, uh, conceptualizations, models. Um, we're just doing the same thing with behavior essentially. So there's been a lot of them developed. There's some that have shown uh, that they work effectively. There's been shown that they haven't worked effectively. Uh, if you wanna talk about psychology in general, Freud's understanding of psychoanalysis and try to help people out. Um, science has shown it, it doesn't really work. It still perpetuates some in parts of the world. Um, it's been extended in some ways, uh, some for the better, some not for the better, I would say, um, on actually solving problems, that is. Like when you put it to the actual Littmann's test, is this helping people out? Um, but then there's, uh, so you talk about social psychology, um, cognitive behavioral th therapy, uh, behavior analysis, like all these different fields have their own models, their own ways of doing it. Um, with entrepreneurship, now you have this incentive, uh, since we're living in a capitalistic society, most of us, to... Um, create your own model so that you can uh, then profit off of that, you know, model that you have. So there's this problem now, there's too many of them out there um, that is unclear for consumers, but there's uh, evidence of some of them that work really well. So uh, part of this creating transparency that I talked about in the bio um, for like behavioral technologies is which ones actually work um, and which ones can you rely on. And uh, there's, it's not that there's one great end all be all. It depends on what your question is sometimes. Yeah, and so we're interested in the models that are associated with applied behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember when I was speaking at ABA week up at Auckland University here in New Zealand, and I went to my friend's house who's got a master's in ABA. And I looked at a shelf and there are these books, textbooks, and I went, what the heck is in those textbooks? <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. I thought I knew stuff about ABA. So, <laughs> I mean, in the animal training world, we're using ABCs. Is that is that an example of a conceptualization model? 100%. Yes, that is 100% a model. It's the one that's uh, most famous and perpetuated out there. Okay, so that that's our understanding. And that's, when I say our, let me define that, uh, my Ryan Cartledge's interpretation of the animal training community <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that hangs out with this podcast and and uh, other associated circles. Yeah, uh, we that that's our go-to. That's what we're using. I don't uh, I, personally. I'm not r sure that I'm using any other conceptualization systems so, when looking at our animals' behavior. Yeah. So what, what's kind of so, after ABCs? So there's different models, but let's take that model first, just like one step further for fun, like perspective taking activity. So ABC, um, you can look at your dog, uh, whatever species you're working with, like their behavior, right, in that model. So you'd say, what is happening right before uh, they engage in whatever this behavior is and what's happening right after? That'll get your antecedent, your consequence, and you can figure out maybe what's influencing and, and, and look at it that way. Now, one thing, if like you're in a training situation, right, um, let's zoom this out a little. Your antecedent, uh, Ryan, is the, the trainer, would be the dog's in a certain position. When they're in that position, your antecedent, now you're gonna have certain behavior of yours that's triggered. Maybe that's a cue that you're going to be you know, putting out there. Um, and now at that point, your behavior of delivering that cue is now that dog's antecedent. So these things are interconnected. They're in sync, they're happening at the same, same moment, just different perspectives. Now the dog's behavior is now your consequence for your first thing, which was looking at their positioning, right? So you can deliver your cue. Now following under that would be um, their behavior now is again, not only was it your consequence for your first behavior, right? Of setting up the cue, but it's now also your antecedent for what are you supposed to do, right? On your decision tree. Do I click, do I, et cetera. Um, and that click, maybe let's say you do a click as your second behavior. Um, that's a consequence for your dog's behavior 
um, in that situation. And that change just flows. And we want to talk about how crazy that gets. Just think about me describing that. How many times, you know, you as a listener listened in um, and said, yeah, no, I get it or not. You know, you, maybe you nodded or whatnot. We just had maybe three, four dozen potential interactions of that ABC model and that quick description. So it flows too fast. And again, this is where, you know, I think AI could help us out. But the point here is that um, it's moving very quickly and it's interconnected. So that's a point that isn't always made in these models very like abundantly clear um, is that you are as much a part of influencing it and understanding it as um, whoever it is that you're trying to work with. Now, if you wanted to move into uh, other, is there questions there on that one or do we want to move into the other models? What do you think? No, you might see me like wriggling around because then because I, oh, I had a really itchy back and then I itched my back and then I got cramp in my arm. Sorry, <laughs> like I'm being really weird and you're distorted good, you're good. here. You're on the right track. Yeah. Um, okay, do you want me to hop in the other models? Yeah, so we've we got this interconnected and moving quickly kind of yep. set of ABCs that changes depending on what yeah. kind okay. of angle you're cool. looking at. I'm it. ready for the next one. So, all right, so... If we move into other models, you have that same interconnected always going on, um, but you can break it down more. So let's take antecedents. There's going to be two things primarily that broke down um, in the literature after we talked about ABCs, which was how do you break down the antecedent into two things, motivation and your cue. So you, uh, the, the whole saying of you can't lead a horse to water, right? Um, the idea is that uh, motivation is, much as a pr is as much of a problem as it is uh, your cue or your situation you're trying to teach or whatever it is that you're working in there. So we break this antecedent down into two different things. The technical terms would be a discriminative stimulus. I hate saying the word. It's just uh, it's a lot for saying a cue. Um, and then the motivation aspect, which I told you we can break down further, but for now you could just break that down um, into those two things. So now uh, if you were say a trainer and you were talking about this ABC model and you're like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to set this up, um, but the dog's just not, you know, like getting in position for the cue. Now we could talk about well, like, well, is it the way in which you're standing? Is it certain, you know, movements of which you're trying to cue this behavior that's going on? Or is it like the dog just ate um, an entire, you know, uh, plate of food 30 minutes before you tried to do your training session and uh, they're satiated. They're not hungry. They're not motivated to do this sort of thing. So it gives you more to work with. That's like I was talking about, like more variables, more to work with. A little more of stress involved, but when you understand it, now you have more to work with. Um, so that was kind of the next progression of that ABC model. Now the ABC model is something that uh, is obviously because it's just three, um, or it's at least perceived as it's easier to get out there, disseminate, push out, um, and that's why you see it in different applications of school settings. Um, and you said a lot of the, the listeners are probably in tune and aware of that. But when you're talking about, you know, the SD and motivation behavior consequence model, um, that was specifically BF Skinner's model um, that I'm referring to there. And it's like this traditional behavior analysis. A lot of other people uh, believe in it as well. Um, but that's not as far. Like you got to get your master's degree. You got to have one of those books on the shelves probably that you were talking about to get a little bit more into that. Um, and then there's some fringe areas as well. So the one that we've been playing around with and talking about a little bit is this one that breaks it down into, uh, I would say like 12 or 14 different parts in the contingency, um, which I think I can tackle verbally for a podcast if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, and define define contingency. So just once again, just aware of that curse of knowledge and people yep. that are listening to this that might not be in for line sure. With that. So contingency is really simple. Just think if then, like an if then relation. So if this, then this happens. Um, so if I were to pick up my phone and press the button, um, what it's going to do is it's I have an iPhone, so it's likely to unlock and show me the screen um, and what's going on, right? That is a very simple example of it. It could be if I stand up, then uh, I've got a new perspective on what's going on. Maybe I'm in a stadium, right? Can't see what's going on. If I stand up, then boom, this is the consequence of what's going to happen. I'm going to be able to see more. Um, so that's the basic thing. A real true contingency is if this happens and only if this happens, then this will follow. So it's a very specific, like, this is the only way that this sort of condition will happen. Um, so people want to note that as well. Uh, that is a contingency. Um, big word for if then it's usually talked about in contingency plans, backup plans and stuff. Um, and that's kind of, I think the roots of those sort of things. So, okay. What's next? Sorry. Well, I feel like, you know, we don't, I haven't really thought about this in 
under the umbrella term conceptualization models before. <laughs> um, but when, when we're adding motivation in there, we talk about motivating operatives. Is that the same yeah. thing? Yeah, okay. Uh, when, we're, when we're talking about if this happens and only if this happens, we kind of talk about stimulus control. For sure. Uh, are these parts of that model or are they? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to break those two terms down. That's perfect. So the, the motivation operations, um, your MO, your big uh, motivation term. That's the one I talked about earlier where you could break it down to two different things. You have your motivation operation is the idea. It's this concept for, um, we're going to be talking about motivation with behavior when we say that word. It breaks down to two things, um, the establishing operation and the abolishing operation. That is, how do I make something more enticing and how do I make something less enticing? That's all I mean there with the establishing and abolishing operation. Bam. Um, now, so I can break those two things down. And that's what I was saying. Like, if I want to get more of a certain behavior, uh, let's say the dog, um, you know, example where it's like, I need them to come back, sit down. And I, I want them to be like actively engaged and excited to be like working on this sort of behavior. Now, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Um, but if I feed them, uh, you know, food or someone fed them food 30 minutes before the training session, that is going to serve as the abolishing operation. It's going to decrease and make it less likely that they're motivated to engage in whatever behavior. Whereas the flip side of a little bit of hunger will increase that and help that out, right? Um, so that's one example of how this model can be broke down a little bit more. When you talk about stimulus control, this is where it gets a, um, a little bit more fun. There's two things that come to mind in this larger like 12 term um, you know, kind of big contingency stream that we're talking about, which is uh, the first one I'll talk about is stimulus props. Um, so people talk about this as like your context usually. So let's say that you only work in a certain context all the time. Even though you don't intentionally mean for those things to sort of influence behavior, they do. Um, now the degree is to which it can depend on the individual. So sometimes this is like a uh, like if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem, sometimes you go to a different room of the house, different area of the backyard. And like you can sometimes, you know, get a different picture on what's going on with behavior in those situations. Um, the most clean example I've ever found was uh, in early drug research. Um, this is like a, uh, I, I don't condone to these sort of things. And it's kind of crazy how they, they go about doing this sort of research. Um, but this is how, at least in the States, the Federal Drug Administration was understanding um, and others are trying to understand the behavioral effects of drugs. Um, they're trying to understand uh, overdoses, right? Like a significant big problem um, socially. Uh, and they were using rat models. And the idea was, could you essentially um, uh, take something like uh, uh, heroin and the, the active ingredients in those? Um, and what happens is you build tolerance up. So you build this like tolerance over time, right? And you can have more and more and more of it as a result. What's happening is there's this compensatory effect. You have uh, the environment, the the training situation that they're in, um, or sorry, the, the the cage that they're in, et cetera, that was creating the opposite effect that that drug does. So you take something like heroin that's a downer, the environment would trigger an upper. So what it does is the environment demonstrably, reliably, every time, would start to increase their heart rate, their blood pressure, and those sort of things to compensate for the heroin that's going to be coming. <laughs> and, and the thing here is you're trying to maintain this homeostasis, right? Well... Uh, the thing is, is the question then became like, what happens if you move them to a new environment? And for people thinking like, people knowing where this is going, I mean, it results in death and it's, it's crazy research um, for the rats. But the, the question was like, what happens when people are overdosing? Like what's going on here? Um, and when they moved the rats over, you can give the same amount that they were getting consistently without causing the overdose. When you moved them to a novel cage, it would produce, um, I think it was something like 80 or 85% of the rats would die on the first hit um, of that drug. And that's because that compensatory uh, effect isn't occurring in that environment. Um, and again, this was like not programmed into this if and only if contingency stream. It just happened in the environment where this stuff was going on. And uh, as a result, that uh, research line starts to inform these like larger, you know, um, models of like, oh man, like you're your stimulus props, as they call them, like these things around you, your context can actually be influencing way more than you thought. Um, so it starts to get into uh, these extra extrapolations of, um, I remember reading a book on Slash, the guitarist in Guns N' Roses. Uh, and he talked about, I hit the same amount that I always hit, but he did it in, the, uh, in a bar in the UK or something like that when they were on tour. And then he wakes up the next day and they're like, yeah, you, you died, but like we brought you back to life. Um, and so these models provide some some clarity, I guess, into those 
those sort of things. But you obviously can't study them research-wise uh, with the same control uh, that they were doing those animal research studies. Derailed there a little. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's got. Um, if, if you're like me out there listening to this podcast, uh, then you're you're probably thinking about training your animals at home or in a zoo or a vet clinic or wherever you're working, and uh, all of those. Sorry, what stimulus props you called it, didn't you? It's everything that you're, think about this way, everything that you're not usually thinking about. So if you're going to take the, the zoo training, right? Um, maybe you have your trainer walk in, they're used to standing in a certain place, um, they cue the animal to come up and work on whatever it is and similar patterns. Sorry, I, I can't get specifics because I don't work in those situations. <laughs> so it's like the best I can do. Um, and, you know, you're, you're used to your session being, you know, conducted in the same way. And it works and it largely works very well. Um and it could work forever in that sort of capacity. What would happen, what the stimulus props would be there, the context would be everything else that you're, you're usually not paying attention to. So it might be um, the shrubs that have been installed in the back corner for the last five years. It could be the water temperature um, that's always the same amount because it's regulated all the time. It could be um, the ambient temperature. It could be the fact that you have nobody else in the room maybe during your training sessions, or it could be, you know, that you're in a situation where you have multiple species living in the same place. So these other species, um, noises they're making now are a part of that where, um, you're not intentionally having those things part of your influence of the behavior, but they could be, and you don't know unless you remove them. Um, and that's what that example that I talked about, that extreme example of the rat, um, which was highlighting. But we know that they happen everywhere. Yeah, so many applications, and I think we could probably do an actual whole podcast episode just yeah. on this one topic. <laughs> um, but we're running out of time, so we're going to move on to the next question. And for this part, I'm a, I'm a massive, as I know you are, fan of telling stories. So can you think back through your experience, Ryan, and share maybe one pinnacle story that kind of sticks out to you that you took a huge lesson away from with regards to applied behavior analysis? Yeah. So I worked with this guy that we're going to call Johnny for the sake of anonymity. And he was a student in a charter school in Florida. And uh, he had a brother with autism, uh, quote, very high functioning, his brother was. And uh, Johnny was very like under the radar. We talk about it as like eggshells. Like you can kind of walk on, walk around these eggshells and you can, you can make sure that you're, you're not doing certain things as the teacher or the teacher's assistant. And Johnny would just fly by. No tantrums, great day. Um, you'd be able to teach a little bit and he'd go home happy. But when you're looking at these sort of things on a grand scale, like he was not learning nearly as much as he needed to be learning. And we knew that we could help him out if we had certain procedures that had been shown in this applied behavior analysis um, implemented to help him out. And I'm not talking about anything crazy. There's no punishment strategies, nothing like that. It was just very simple reinforcement based. Like let's, let's help teach this student um, certain things. So he was six years old. He has, uh, or seven, six or seven. He has two words in his vocabulary, no and mango. You can tell people to, you know, F off. Like, I don't want that. And he can ask for his favorite thing in the world, mango. That's it. Um, now you should have those two words when you're like two years old. Um, like it's a very, very different, like you're, you're and we are talking about, you know, uh, you're three times further down your life lifespan at that time. And you don't even have those like you're like you're leagues behind, um, uh, where you should be developmentally to, to at least be set up more successfully, hopefully. Um, so he would tantrum, uh, when we actually would start to try to teach him, he had this history of, uh, not wanting to be a part of those sort of things. And, uh, the degree to which, why this was a thing, I don't know if it was past teachers, training situations, et cetera. Um, but it was difficult to start teaching him to lead to these tantrums. And it was, uh, he's stubborn and I don't blame him. Many of us are, uh, when you don't like things, you, you know, or you have a bad history with them, you don't want them to continue. Um, and if you can get out of those sort of things, you're going to do whatever you can to get out of them. So over time, he had this really good tolerance. And so you'd have two to three hours of tantrums if you're trying to work on helping teach him these sort of things. Now, this is where through careful data collection, keeping the parents on board, making sure the decisions are really clear that we were making, um, over a couple months, those tantrums were down to 15 to 20 minutes a day. Awesome. Uh, rather than three or four, and learning's happening. So all of a sudden, he's catching up on his vocabulary more. He can start to ask for five things a week, 10 things a week, 20 things, 30 things, 40 things, 50 things. Um, and you can see his world transform as a result of this. He can now start to ask for the thing that he wanted. He can point to something, right? Um, and it's not this aversive or bad interaction that he was having all the time with a bunch of other humans. He's starting to enjoy humans too, which is this core uh, 
uh, core, I'm missing the word for it, this core part of, uh, for lack of a better word, part of the diagnosis, diagnosis of autism is this kind of social deficit area. Um, so it's really fascinating. But this 15 to 20 minutes of tantruming when we were working throughout the day just drove us nuts because we were still not understanding them to some capacity. Um, and it was, I think, three or four months later where we had finally stumbled across by somebody else watching me um, that it was a little grimace. Like think about like you get upset or you're trying to think really hard and focus and you like you make a little bit of change in your face, just like a little fur of the brows. That's all it took um, for to maintain his behavior. Um, I had no clue that, you know, I was keeping a straight face as best as I could when the tantrums would happen. But, you know, 15, 20 minutes in, apparently every once in a while, I would give this little bit of like a sigh and a grimace, um, just very subtly. And that was what was maintaining and reinforcing this behavior. Um, and it was, I had realized in that, that moment, like it was a good wake up call as to like everything that I do <laughs> always is going to influence to some degree. Um, and I can't, I can't ignore that, right? Like I've got to pay attention to it. And any way that I can add in making sure that I've got that perspective and I'm understanding that is what I did henceforth. So um, many people struggle with having people come in and kind of audit and look at their procedures and what they're doing. And I'm like, come in and look at it. Like, this is how I'm going to be able to understand, you know, what's going on. And specifically, I had a, another fellow grad student in there that would come in for 15 minutes a day, just kind of watch, observe what I was doing. Um, this is the role of mentors in some capacity, right? To kind of like bring it back into that. Um, and I would have never guessed that this little grimace <laughs> is what maintained this thing for three or four months. And uh, the way we were able to kind of pinpoint that this is for sure it is we were able to flip it. So um, I want him to work on some sort of academic task, right? Because it's in his IEP, uh, his individualized education plan, and it needs to be something he's working on. So what I do is uh, I'd ask him to do it. When he does it, I give him that little grimace real quick. So I just kind of really quickly like scrunch my brows um, and look frustrated. And lo and behold, <laughs> when I do that repeatedly, he would do this task more and more and more and more and more. I can move it over to the next IEP task, something he's trying to learn. And I do it again, I reliably, because uh, it's in a contingency now, right? Like if he does this thing I'm looking for more of, I'm going to provide this little grimace face. He reliably does it more and more and more and more and more. Um, and we were able to demonstrate this over and over and over and over again. And it became this uh, thing of like, okay, do we just kind of grimace at this kid all the time <laughs> for good stuff to happen? Because that's not socially acceptable. Like, that's weird. Um, but we were able to kind of turn into things like, instead of looking at him like, nice, like, good job. It was more of this like, nice. And we kind of like get a little bit more in our throat, you know, and we kind of like uh, give him the smile with a little bit more of an intense kind of fur of the brow. Um, and it was things that we, we'd figure out how to make it, you know, fun, socially, access, ex uh, socially acceptable to do these sort of things. Um, so that's always resonated with me um, specifically. And I, I don't think it applies just to humans. Like the, the, any animal is looking uh, and paying attention to the most subtle little things sometimes. Um, so I'm sure people have stories. I'd love to hear people's stories, as a matter of fact, like if they've got something like that. Just so I've got some more in my arsenal that I can point to and uh, at least refer people to as well. Yeah, I think all the, all the dog trainers are probably feeling that one. Uh, I'm, I've am i been sitting the GoPro up at my desk to try and pinpoint what I'm doing as I'm sitting here doing a podcast and Phoebe's behind me and for whatever reason, there's numerous throughout the day, she might offer some uh, vocalizations, some loud barks. I want to see what I'm doing on my face. <laughs> like I'm, I'm yeah. trying to capture it. I haven't got there yet. And someday we'll just have this out-of-the-box solution you can set up. It'll watch, right? AI will tell you this is what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Siri, what's the function of that baby? Tell me now. Yeah, right? <laughs> And that does bring us to our final question. Uh, just quickly, Ryan, can you just chuck on the end here? What what would you really like to see happen in the next five to ten years in the applied behavior analysis field? Um, so, like any field, it starts to branch into. There's a lot of different like you know, flavors of the week or styles or you know camps that people are really interested in, and so that's only fractured more. It's only going to continue to fracture more. Um, and what I'd really like to see is a place where you've got two things. You've got an openness to willing and listening to others all the time. Um, but you also have these different people coming together of the practitioners, the uh, you know people that are delivering therapy one-on-one -on -one all the time to your ivory tower sort of folks all coming together and trying to like bring this stuff back into a comprehensive like model. That means you have your technology people there, your business people there, et cetera. Um, 
And part of the Convergence Conference, this other conference I run called NextGen, um, the, that is m my, my place personally, but also there's a lot of partners involved in there that also share this vision. It's our place to try to push that forward. Um, so I hope to see a lot more integration to technology, uh, companies that are willing to risk uh, not taking the uh, kind of status quo treatment approach of this is how we do things and because this is what we get paid for in this model and it's been shown to be effective, but we know it's not perfectly effective. Like autism treatment, for example, it's supposedly our bread and butter. Um, we are sometimes at best 50% um, successful at helping that population out. Um, and we're just getting to the point where we have really long-term studies and start coming out and we are going to be questioned on the efficacy um, of this. And it's only going to get scrutinized more and it should, uh, and it very much should. So it's, uh, it's kind of this time to uh, bring together the people that are interested in this technology um, and creating these scalable solutions to come together. Um, and I think in the next five to 10 years, where they're going to make it or break it. Our field will uh, move into those realms. We'll have some successful uh, feet like in those realms, or we're going to um, kind of continually be in the position where we're at, which is we're effective with a, a, a reasonably small proportion of the world and helping them out. And we do sometimes really good there, um, but we're not going to really pursue this vision of, quote, saving the world, you know, um, and making it a place where everybody's happy, healthy, comfortable, etc. Yeah, we definitely walk in the walk and talk in the talk with your convergent conference and your involvement in that. that yeah. There's a big team, team got, behind that. I've got a lot more to deliver in the next 30 years, I think, to like rest my head feeling that I really delivered on that. But things are going great. There's a great <laughs> and, movement. <laughs> and we'll, we'll link to the Next Generation, uh, Next Gen conference as well if you want to cool. learn more about that in the podcast right yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, and so that does bring us to the end. This podcast has been Mango. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. hopefully it's useful. I will take any questions, any criticism, any of that. Like hit me up in a, a direct message. Um, I love connecting afterwards. So like I always tell people, like don't hesitate to reach out. Um, awesome. And we'll, we'll connect all those touch points in the podcast right up as well. Perfect. Hey, this has been so much fun, Ryan. On behalf of everyone listening and myself, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. I know you and I caught up for a Facebook Live a couple yeah. of months ago. I mean, shooting messages back and forth. So thank you for all the time and effort you put into this. Oh, no, for sure. And like likewise, like this platform wasn't built overnight. I know the work that goes in these sort of things. Um, so thank you. And to all the listeners that support that sort of thing, um, I'm sure Ryan tells you this all the time, but it's like, at least my behavior, 99% of like, what's rewarding is the the community engagement and like seeing things being uh, taken further. So thanks to all the listeners as well. Yeah, we got thousands and thousands of downloads that go into these podcasts when they're released. So yeah. I don't know who all of you are, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, go out there and, and make these changes that Ryan's been talking about in this episode. We really appreciate you all out there tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you are interested in carrying on this conversation about applied behavior analysis, working with people working with, and working with our animals, of course, in the most positive, fun, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. Yes. There's something there <laughs> for absolutely everyone and we are pumped and looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode, though. We're going to wrap it up there. Tilo's my cat's come to join me on my desk to say goodbye. You'll hear from us again soon, everyone. She's pushing, key she's pushing buttons on my keyboard now. <laughs> I might have been muted. I think I'm still here. All right, you'll hear from us again soon, everybody. Farewell. <laughs> <laughs>